I am back, and joining me now is the star of the Netflix documentary Behind the Curve and the Poster Child, or Poster Man, Poster Person, not sure, of the Flat Earth Movement. It's Mark Sargent. How you doing? Best intro ever. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. I uh, really enjoyed the last time you were on. Yeah. Well, Mark, wait, am I pronouncing that right? What, Mark? Mark? Yeah. Mark? Matthew, Mark, Luke, okay. John, if you're into the Bible. Yeah. It's a it's a name. I've heard it. There's a few people doing it. <laughs> That's a shout out to whoever got really annoyed that I kept saying Mark over and over again last time. <laughs> I just had to do it one more time. <laughs> nice. A quick question. Do you own a tortoise? Do I own a tortoise? Like a like a turtle? Yeah. I do not. Although I think they're very, very cool. I mean, they're a little boring as pets, but I, I love the, the species. Why? Yeah, you seem to be in the majority of that. Uh, most people don't. So I was just checking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't own one. <laughs> I, I was always fascinated that um, sea, long sea voyages, you would get giant, you know, tortoises because they last a long, long time and you don't have to feed them much or, or give them much water and then they would eventually eat them. So that I don't think I, I don't think I could have a pet that could outlive me. I think that would kind of, um, on a subconscious level. Well, I guess now that I'm saying it, it's more yeah. of a conscious level, but it would annoy me. Yeah, yeah, because well, you would always wonder. It's like, oh, who's who does my my tortoise go to, or or my elephant? Well, those two animals <laughs> yeah. I know live longer than people. Well, I think a, a tortoise would bother me because this, um. I, I don't know what their intelligence level is, but it's dumber than a human. Yeah. Uh, I have to spend my life taking care of it, and it's just sitting around, and it's going to outlive me. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I brought you on. I wanted to ask, do you believe in the Mandela effect? I know that you have a, a lot of conspiracy theories that you believe in this one i was watching something on uh, actually i was watching something on netflix the other no it was hbo max mm -hmm. and they were talking about the mandela effect mm -hmm. and there were some interesting things i wanted to bring you on and get your take uh you mean the the mandelta effect is that what no that's that's an in, that's an, in, that's an inside me? joke by the way if <laughs> okay. if you're into i, I and it be and then there's the mandetta effect um so yeah <laughs> The um, uh, yeah, I do believe in it. Actually, I, I absolutely believe in the the, the Mandelta effect. In fact, there was a um, a friend of mine who asked me about that at a conference last year, or twenty eighteen, where I'm oh, sorry, twenty nineteen. <laughs> I'm getting the years mixed up. Where uh, I told him there was an instance that I had remembered in a movie that nobody else remembered, which was um. A line, if you remember the original Planet of the Apes from 1968, and mm -hmm. Charlton Heston, when they had first crashed on the planet, which ended up being Earth, uh, he had said that man needs to know his limitations. And they, somebody had said, no, no, um, Clint Eastwood had said that in one of the, um, the Dirty Harry movies. I think it was called The Enforcer. And I said, no, no, Charlton Heston said it. I remember because he said it and then he laughed. It was when the, the, the black guy was planting a little flag next to the lake. And no one else remembered it but me. So, yeah. I mean, it could have been, you know, faulty memory, sure. But there's a lot of stuff out there. And the, the reason why I believe in it is because it sounds – because I'm a huge believer in virtual reality and, and the Matrix and all that. And kind of like the, the black cat from the Matrix. If you see a cat, it, you know, the cat twice type thing. You know, there's a glitch and I know through all the, the computer stuff that I did over the years that if you save a document, because I was notorious for this, I'd, I'd like use the same. In fact, I still do it now. Um, I save the same Word document and redo it with my daily tasks and I do it over and over and day after day. And after a while, if you kept saving things over, some weird formatting stuff would happen in the background where it shouldn't be possible. You know, it's just pretty straightforward. You're saving the document. You're saving the document. And it was like this ghost in the machine type deal. And when I went to my programmer friends, I was going, what do you think this is happening? And they just shake their head. And it's like, man, I don't know. It's computers, you know. Even even today in 2021, we still have to reboot computers. You know, that's yeah. the first thing. It's like something goes wrong. It's like, well, computers are part magic. <laughs> 
they're part <laughs> quantum already. So, sorry, short answer, yes, I absolutely believe in it. And real quick for listeners, the Mandela effect is something... Something I, that actually, it, it's yeah, based on... Have, you'd probably be the best to explain it. Sure, sure, sure. The, men, the, the Mandela, Mandelta, Mandela effect is based off of Nelson Mandela. The original thing that... I, I don't know why that one was the one they chose. I mean, I suppose it's catchy, I guess. Even though there's a lot of people who don't even know who Nelson Mandela was. He was a, a leader down in Africa... And he was jailed for being, a, you know, an, an activist and, and, you know, the people in power, you know, they fight over stuff. Kind of like what we're doing now in the United States. And he was jailed and there's a whole bunch of people that thought he died in jail. And it turns out he, he well, it turns out he wasn't dead. He was alive. And, but there was a lot of people that remember him dying. You know, there, there were these stories going around. And so there was this, uh, these arguments that would go back and forth between people. And you, you run into these from time to time where you'll have, a, like, if you haven't, like, 10 people in a room, they will argue about things. And, and we all, it all comes down to memory. Since we don't have the ability to map the human mind, we don't, you know, like certain movies where you can actually record memories. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no way to prove it. And, but you know, like the obvious ones would be like the Berenstein Bears versus the Berenstain Bears. Uh, if yeah. you're in the children's book, uh, there's a tons of people that remember it as the Berenstein. But if you look it up right now, it's Berenstain. Um, the little things, a lot of it's it's media. A lot of it's media. Uh, one of the big ones, though, that just that I was really surprised was the girlfriend of Jaws in James Bond. You know, the, the big Hurkin guy with the metal teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, she was, everyone remembers her. It's like, oh, yeah, they had this common connection because she had braces. That's how he fell in love with you. Yeah, she was this cute little blonde girl, you know, like this, like straight, straight out of a Swiss Miss Coco ad. But she smiled and she had a big set of, of braces. She had a grill. And he smiled and they, you know, the music and the connection. Poof, you look now, she has no braces. And it doesn't even make sense now. You're looking, why Why does this happen? Uh, you know, and so the thought is, is that history has been changed. That's that's really the Mandela effect, is that we are living in, you know, we, we've all heard of parallel universes and timelines and stuff like that. Time travel movies, I'm always fascinated with. And the, the butterfly effect, I really, really love. In fact, if you have never watched the butterfly effect of the movie, I highly recommend it. Uh, but that we're living in a world that is being updated on the fly. But for some reason, there are people out there that remember some of the old changes, which kind of harkens back to what I was talking about, which is maybe if enough changes are made in the matrix, there are glitches, not necessarily in the matrix itself, but in the memory of the people. There's some people that remember the slightly older versions of whatever it is. And it's it's fascinating. And it's been around for a couple, number of years now. So there you go, Mandela you know, Effect. The thing that stands out to me, and I'm not sure if it's the Mandela Effect or if I'm just completely misremembering, hmm. but one of the things is Febreze. Uh -huh. Now, in my mind, every time... I remember seeing anything about Febreze. It was F E and Breeze was spelled like Breeze. Yeah. But apparently on the bottle there's only one E in Breeze. Yeah. So I I that blew my mind because until I saw that being discussed on that HBO show, yeah. in in my head, that's how I've always seen it. I don't know if I put it there because I just assumed Breeze was spelled that way or what, but yeah. uh I was really shocked that it's that it's spelled differently than I've always thought it was spelled. Right. I'm looking. In fact, I'm looking up some of the top ones that people remember. And like the Monopoly Man, a lot of people when you when you think of the Monopoly Man, you think that he has a monocle, and most people remember him having a little monocle. You know, a little uh, yeah. one one binocular. You know, one set of glass thing, and he doesn't. He absolutely does not. And there's some people say, okay, well, maybe you're confusing it with the um, the, the peanut butter, the, the peanut yeah, with, the, with, the top, peanut. with the top hat. I've, you know, um, let's see, Jiffy peanut butter. Um, 
technically, you know, a lot of people remember Jiffy Peanut Butter, right? But mm -hmm. su supposedly there has never been a Jiffy brand peanut butter. There's always, there's been Jiff and Skippy, but never Jiffy. And so I was like, okay, so you're telling me all these people are combining Jiff and Skippy and came up with Jiffy on their own? Um, let me you think. know what? I might edit that out and me and you will start Jiffy peanut butter. <laughs> Everybody already knows the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, let's see here for the loom label, uh, the frowning Mona Lisa. Oh, that's an interpretation. Oh, okay. One of the big ones. Okay. One of the big ones was Ed McMahon and the publisher's clearinghouse thing. Right. And so if you're old enough to remember oh. Ed McMahon, who was the co-host of Johnny Carson, who yeah. would be in these commercials where he would show up at people's doors with a giant check, right. With the publisher's clearinghouse millions, uh, mm -hmm. sweepstakes supposedly now he never was there he was never there now he support he endorsed american family publishers while the entities were similar mcmahon never appeared on camera as part of the prize patrol and i remember vividly him showing up at people's houses because that was the the star factor you know the the starstruck right. thing you wouldn't want that guy showing up at your door it's like oh it's ed mcmahon the the co-host of the most popular nighttime show in america he was never there. Uh, here's the Berenstein versus uh, Berenstain. Yep. I, I, I could have sworn it was, uh, let's see, C, C3PO, Risky Business. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Remember Tom Cruise dancing in his underwear, dress shirt, and Ray-Bans while home alone in 1983's Risky Business. Uh, but if you watch the movie now, he doesn't wear sunglasses. Hmm. And it's like, oh, oh, really? He didn't? Uh, yeah, and there's tons of them, tons of them. It's a, it's a thing out there. I mean, there's a lot of people. Now, is it is it the, the reason why I think it's it's catchy more than other conspiracies is it's not sinister at all. It's uh -huh. it's this fun little thing, and and because it's unprovable, because we don't have the ability to record and play back on video, the the human mind, the human memory, we we don't have a way to do this, and so you just have to whatever it is now. You have to say that was it for all time. But as we know, human perception is a, a very, very tricky thing. Um, let me end this part with this, which is, do you remember the uh, the dress argument, the black dress, white dress argument? Yeah. 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 I mean, and that's that's people in the same room looking at the exact same image on the screen. And you, you'd right. have seven people saying it was black and the other, you know, with whatever and whatever trim and the other three would say that it was white. Who's right? In fact, you could give them both lie detector tests and they would all pass. It's it right. comes down to perception. So, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting thing. And do I Yeah. Do I believe in it? Yes, because it ties in with the virtual issues that we have. I, I firmly believe, you know, that regardless whether God created it or not, that we are living in a matrix type scenario and it ties in with the um the double slit experiment and the neuroscience versus free will experiment which just scream that you know that this place is digital and it's that would be one of the side effects is you know little little things i mean i was it was fascinating that they built that into the matrix where they saw the same cat twice thought that, right. thought that was a nice little nice little wrinkle and in our case in in this world it seems to be little aspects that most of the population remembers a certain way and we don't have all the numbers but uh, but a, a certain section of the population remembers it a slightly different version well i had something happen the other day yeah and when it did i thought you know what i need to talk to mark about this and see how he can explain this with the flat earth movement so I put a can of Sprite in the freezer, right? In the, a can of Sprite? Yeah. Okay. So I forgot about it. The next day I opened the freezer to get some ice. I see that the can has has exploded. Yeah. Uh, not fully, just you can see there was some, some yeah. Sprite chunks on the ice tray. Yeah. I get it out, and it occurs to me if it was glass, if I had a glass, glass cup in the freezer and I left it in there for a long time and then I got it and I poured scalding hot water on it the glass would break right 
So I thought, what would happen if I did the same thing to this can of Sprite? And I put it in the sink. I run scalding hot water on it. And all of a sudden, this mist, almost like you're at a, a like a uh, amusement park where they have the mist machines so you can walk through and get cooled off, but you're not right, right, wet. Right, right, Sprite is just going everywhere in this mist form. And I thought, if the world was flat, how would that be possible? <laughs> I got to say, out of all the interviews I've done, I have never heard that one. Okay, so... <laughs> If I changed your mind, didn't I? The, okay, so if Sprite <laughs> is spraying, Sprite effect. if Sprite is spraying in all directions from a bursting can, mm -hmm. this you're wondering how the flat Earth explains that because of gravity or buoyancy, or are you just what? Why would what would you explain? You know, I, I will I will take this question back at you. What would you <laughs> expect it to do if the world was flat? Not do that, apparently. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because why? Because you know what? I uh, I never really thought about it, <laughs> and uh, you got me. Okay. Right, okay. Mark. So when it when it comes to all right. I'll, I'll I'll take the generic approach on this one, which is right. let's let's just tie it to gravity because a lot of people will say that gravity seems to be the answer for just about ninety percent of the the science questions that we get when it comes to comparisons. It's like, well, gravity says this or gravity says that. And um, first off, let's let's get the, the obvious out of the way, which is if we are living in a flat enclosed world, it's not spinning. There's no centrifugal force. Now, is there gravity? Is there some people in the, in the community say, well, no, there's no gravity at all. It's just buoyancy, which means if you're in a pressurized system, you know, layers of density just naturally form. Um, however, I go along the lines of, well, science can't even tell you. You ask any scientist, any physicist, they can't tell you what gravity is. They can only tell you what it does. Meaning they can only tell if gravity has side effects but they can't reproduce it artificially. So they get, they can't really, you know, again, they, they, their answer is, well, gravity is a magical molecular force that pulls things down to the center of a sphere with mass. And we say, well, that gravity is a magical molecular force that just pulls things straight down. Not necessarily because of mass. I mean, I suppose there, there could be mass, but again, since science can't really define it, we're not gonna take that leap and, and define it either. Only that it, it really acts almost identical to what it does on a sphere. There's there's almost no difference at all other than, again, maybe a slight angle, but it would be so gradual that you'd never be able to detect it. So does that kind of help, kind of? Yeah, I think we're both saying the same thing. And and when it comes to the pressurized system, I, I got I to gotta clarify this real fast, which is if you were living in a pressurized system, that would explain a lot, meaning why when you take a volleyball or a beach ball and you hold it underwater, why does it pop back up? Well, because it's it's less dense than the water. And when you take a helium balloon, let go, why? You know, why does it go up? Well, it goes up because it's less dense than the air around it. And hot air, you know, rises, cold air falls, you know, that whole thing. And what, what the, the big problem is, again, if you're believing a sphere, is that what happens when it gets up to space, for example? It, it's a question I've posed to every scientist I, I ever talked to, which is where, what happens at the bleeding edge of space? What happens when our atmosphere ends and space begins? Because physics, straight up, thermodynamics says it's a simple law that says that pressure, a pressurized system cannot exist to a, next to a non-pressurized system without some sort of barrier. We see that, you know, a, a vacuum. You know, what we're breathing in right now, what you're breathing in right this second is not nothing. It looks like nothing because it's transparent, but it's not nothing. It's 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. And vacuum, there's nothing. There's, there's no molecules. The only reason we get confused is we can't see the air we're breathing in. So why doesn't space, which is apparently is nothing, why doesn't that... Uh, 
why does that? There's a cat that's bothering me. Um, <laughs> well, sure if, 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 you, if you hear all yowling, that's why it's a it's a restless cat. Um, it you know why doesn't the va- the empty vacuum of space rip off our atmosphere? And you say, well, gravity again. It's that uh, that mysterious gravity thing. And it's like, no, 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 because here's why that that has a problem. If you take a vacuum chamber and you put it above you in the second floor above you and you put a valve between there and where you were sitting right now and you pop that valve, what do you think happens? It's not like the movies. It's instant. It's violent. And your air in your where you're sitting right now will get sucked straight up. It will equalize instantly. The movies absolutely just botch that every time. And I know it's for dramatic effect. So the question is, why didn't gravity keep the air in your room? Well, because vacuum will win every time. Vacuum, the force of a vacuum is stronger. And so, you know, the follow-up question is, when you walk outside, why is the atmosphere not rushing upstairs? Why is it not rushing into space? And and your instinct, your your knee-jerk reaction will always be, well, gravity, obviously. It's like, you mean the same? My knee-jerk? The what? You're just saying that. My knee-jerk just... You saying that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, again, <laughs> it's one of those things that that science we. The, the reason why our community, you know, is is skeptical is because the the general public believes whatever the lab coats tell them. You know, it's all well, that guy's wearing a lab coat, he's carrying a clipboard. He's obviously more intelligent than me. Therefore, whatever he says, you know, I am going to believe. That's a very powerful and very slippery slope. You should question everything yourself. You know, do your own research, ask questions. And I, what I try to tell people, and I know I'm rambling, which is, you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? Sure, I can test that with a pan and some water and make sure I'm at sea level. Right now, you want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like? Not so fast. Because the, the deepest hole ever drilled is only eight miles. So why are you showing me all these cross sections of what the earth looks like? And in fact, you read the fine print. Science will say, yeah, we have no idea what's down there. We're just extrapolating. And it's like, why are you showing it? Why, why don't you put that somewhere? It's like, well, because we don't like putting question marks in textbooks. We don't want people asking questions. Anyway, sorry. Well, I don't want to end things on a dark note. Okay, what do you, where, where do you want to go? Well, that's that's where I was going, and like I said, I, I don't want it to be too dark. Oh, I can give you. When I, can, I, I can give you light stuff. Give me something to go with. When I explained about the sprite exploding in it, it was like a, a mist coming out because it came out of the small hole, and it just that's just how it looked. Yeah. While I was talking to you, I have the word sprite in front of me to remind me to uh, try to catch you in that little flat earth trap yeah. um i noticed that sprite has most of the letters in it that sierra mist has do you think some sierra mist has just exploded sprite cans repackaged i think that well i have mixed feelings about that because okay. i i'm a big believer in um uh corporate collusion but i am also a big believer in corporate espionage and there are some corporations that work together as part of a team monopoly and there are other corporations that would like to drive each other into the ground uh when it comes to the sierra miss sprite connection uh it's kind of tough because wait sierra sierra miss is owned by pepsi if i'm not mistaken is that true I should look that up real fast. You know what? I don't know. I have to look that up. Let me look that up. Who owns, All right. who owns Sierra Mist? Uh, yeah, it's Pepsi. So, okay. yeah, that's that's a rivalry. Uh, no, I do not think they um, are in collusion because that's literally Pepsi versus Coke. And that's, that's a corporate rivalry that has been going on for a very, very long time. And uh, Coke has the market share and they spend the most money and... But Pepsi's, you know, had some interesting products over the years. Uh, you know, they've also done very, very well. I, I think the heat of their rivalry was back in the 80s when they were pretty even. They were both going for these massive, you know, who could get the biggest celebrity. And mm-hmm. uh, I believe, I, in fact, if my memory serves me, I think Pepsi had the Jacksons. You know, the Michael Jackson and the Jacksons, that was their big push. So, no, I don't think there's any collusion between uh, Pepsi and Coke on the uh, Sierra Mist thing. Oh, but but to but to your point, 
do uh-huh. corporations steal each other's ideas and demographic targeting things? Yes, you bet they do all the time. I mean, how many, how many, di- you can go to the grocery store and how many names are close to the other names? Because if right. one company comes up with a name that does really well with a focus group, well, why, my, why mess with success? You, you want to get something as close as possible. Um, a great one would be, uh, just, just one example would be Kool-Aid versus Flavor-Aid, right? You, or, yeah. You co- yeah. That's a good one. Copyright is, is, is an easier thing to get around than you might think. As long as you don't use the same wavy graphics and the same color scheme, you can, and which is why corporations will sometimes trademark, you, you know, the logo as close as possible. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. How's that? And. And that's why our Jiffy peanut butter is going to be a success. Exactly. Exactly. Well, no, I think Jiff would probably sue us. <laughs> if we Skippy won't <laughs> sue us, but Jiff, I think, would come straight for us if we did that. Well, it was great talking to you as always, Mark. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to promote before you go? Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you're out there, um, you know, if you want to find me, just type in Flat Earth Mark into YouTube. It's easy enough to find my stuff. I have three books on Amazon. Just type in Flat Earth Mark Sargent. Uh, the documentary is called Behind the Curve. And you know, again, lots of other stuff out there, but that'll that'll get you started. You know what? When you said that, it, it brought this last question. And I promise this will be the last one. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I believe search you. Flat okay. Earth Mark on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about hills? <sighs> I no well yeah I hate all hills no you know that's funny you would mention that because my favorite my I have this image of you just trying to stomp the hill no 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 I don't I don't hate hills and mountains because I don't hate them anyway I think you know there's wonderful decor they're once wonderful decorative things do uh, but my favorite land masses and or geographic things are salt flats not because not because I was in I was I loved them before I was into flat earth um, I just like, they're, they're so clean and there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of order to them. It, it gives me a lot of peace, but do I think like, the, you know, because people will say, Oh, do mountains prove flat earth? No, no. What I'm saying is the beginning of the end of the last landmass line up kind of like Kansas, for example, Kansas mm-hmm. is freaking tabletop flat. Uh, some university did a, did a study of you some years back and it's as flat as a pancake. But yeah, there's some hills in the middle of it. It's like, yeah, as long as the, the beginning and the end line up, it's it's no different than what you do on a on a on a dining room table. The dining room table is still flat no matter what you put in the middle of it. There you go. Well, I've I've actually added a little bit of contortions to my dining room table just to sort of give it some some texture. Some texture, nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. It was great talking to you. I love having you on. I hope you come back again sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much and have a great day. All right. Have a great day, Mark. It, right. it really was. This is off the air. It was great talking to you. It was a lot of fun. So can't wait to do it again. All right. Thanks, man. No problem. All Bye. Right. Bye-bye.